Uh, this one's a video that's just come up because I just posted the motor vehicle video and um, I thought I would try to describe some solutions besides using the usual and ordinary conveyance of the day, uh, which is what I do. Okay, there's uh, let me explain in my status as a what you call a denizen, somebody who's born here but is not a corporate member in the world among the U.S. world, cosmos, constitution, orders, government, but not of. I don't have any of the uh, contracts that bind me like citizenship, social security numbers, birth certificates, and all that stuff. Um, that means I got to do things a lot differently than the typical 14th Amendment U.S. citizen, U.S. person. Um, so like uh, I, ex I can exercise all my rights. So... You know, to travel, I walk, I bike. I don't have a horse, but, you know, one of these days I might. I used to, but I don't anymore. Um, and I may return to having a horse, depends. But those three ways of transportation, whether you ride a horse or use a horse and buggy or a horse and wagon, bicycling or walking, you're exercising a right under natural and common law rather than a, a regulated privileged under commercial law, civil commercial law, which is what driving is, okay? And the reason you have to do that is because you don't really own that property. Okay, with a motor vehicle, if you watch, you know, there's several videos in this playlist, I've already covered that. Um, even though you don't really own the horse or the bicycle, those are the, the if you got a horse, you probably paid with it with Federal Reserve cash or, you know, an I, you know, IOUs, checks, credit, whatever. Same with a bicycle. Like the bicycle I have, I used Federal Reserve note dollar units to, to get it. That means, I as but I understand that I have only a mere legal title to that bicycle. But walking, biking, and riding a horse or a horse and wagon are still the usual and ordinary conveyances of the day. And even though if you used, if you uh, paid with them with Federal Reserve note dollar units, uh, monetized debt, you'll notice that you don't have to put a license plate on a wagon or a buggy. You don't have to wear a license plate on your butt when you're walking around town. You don't have to put a license plate on your bicycle. Um, you don't have to have a license to, to, to ride a bike or to ride a horse or to walk. Okay, and that's, that's the indicator that now you're exercising a right rather than a privilege that of the unusual and extraordinary. That's totally regulated and controlled by the king, i.e. the state, the government. Okay, so now I have never done this, and I've always wanted to, but I've just never had the time to put into this to test this matter legally. Let me... Uh, let me show you this case here. Now, this this is kind of an unusual case. Uh, and this is what's inspired me to try this. But like I said, I've never been able to have the time to do this. Now, this case, which is um, from the U.S. Court uh, Circuit Court of Appeals in the Ninth Circuit, it's called U.S. versus Stewart. And this comes from back in 2003. Now, let me give you a little background on this case. This fellow, Stewart, was a U.S. citizen, a 14th Amendment U.S. citizen, with all the, you know, birth certificate and all that stuff. He was typically 14th Amendment, okay? He was a blacksmith or a gunsmith uh, who had a federal firearms license. And how he got into trouble was he was making and selling kits in the stream of commerce, interstate, under that FL federal firearms license to people to modify their semi certain semi-automatic guns, rifles, whatever, to convert them into full auto. That's what got him in trouble with the BATF or whatever it was, ATF, whatever it was called then. Okay. And they raided his shop and took all those kits that he was selling. And they also, in his shop, found machine guns, fully auto machine guns, and they seized them as well because, you know, you got to have a special permit, license, tax stamp to own a full auto gun in the United States. 
Um, and he didn't have that for those guns. So they seized those as well. Now, those guns were homemade. He made those himself outside the stream of commerce. And when the ATF tested them and all that stuff, they agreed. So here's where we get into the, what the court said. Now pay attention here, kids. This is important. There are three categories of activity that Congress can regulate under its commerce power. Now, the Article 1, Section 8, Congress has exclusive and plenary power over interstate and foreign commerce. And that's the way it's always been throughout all human history. Commerce, which is biblically called Canaanite traffic, is not private natural law business under the God of creation or even under common law. It is a special privilege to conduct public business that affects a public interest in the unusual and extraordinary way. Okay, remember in the last video I explained to you the term unusual and extraordinary. It doesn't just apply to motor vehicles. It applies to all kinds of stuff. So commerce has always been the unusual and extraordinary because it's not the usual and ordinary, which the usual and ordinary was established by God and man under common law and natural law, biblical law principles. So once you cross over into Canaanite trafficking, now that's unusual and extraordinary. You're going uh, sinning against the natural law in order to engage in a sinful privilege for which it's totally regulated and controlled. So interstate commerce has always been under a foreign jurisdiction called Maritime Law, Admiralty Maritime, U Uniform Commercial Code. It is not a common or natural law activity. Okay, so Congress has these powers to regulate activity under its commerce power. The use of the channels of interstate commerce. Whoa. So think of all of the ways interstate commerce, all the channels of interstate commerce from the uh, federal highways, waterways, the open sea, the lakes, navigable waterways, you know, so U.S. highways, U.S. interstates, um, the, you know, every way that commerce gets channeled, okay, right down to the public open for public business. And we're going to pull that case up here too, I should. Okay. So now two, the instrumentalities of interstate commerce or persons or things in interstate commerce, even though they, uh, I lost my place. Even though the threat may come only from intrastate activities. Okay, so instrumentalities, persons, and things operating in interstate commerce. Think of Walmart. Even though Walmart is local in your state, in your county, where did all that stuff in Walmart come from? And is Walmart conducting interstate commerce activities? And think about all the things, Amazon, everything that you get is basically interstate commerce even though you may be doing only activities within your state, okay? And three, those activities having a substantial relation to interstate commerce. Wow, they have, they have, and, and this is the way it should be. They have sealed the deal and cornered the market on total regulation of interstate commerce, which is what the Constitution said, okay? All right, so now what about this guy that was a federal firearms license dealing in interstate and foreign commerce through his FLL selling guns and across and selling these kits across state lines? Now that he was found completely guilty of. But what about the machine guns they seized that he made himself? That's the important part here, kids. He made them from scratch by himself outside the stream of commerce. Stewart did not acquire his, his machine guns from someone else. Whether that someone is, a, a, you know, a, a retailer, a wholesaler, or a private person. He fabricated them himself. 
The government has never contested Stewart's claim that the machine guns were entirely homemade. And the evidence supports his claim. The chief of the ATF firearms technology branch, referring to one of the machine guns, testified that it was a unique type of firearm because these firearms were genuinely homemade. I'm trying to emphasize this for you. Genuinely homemade, not rigged. Not partially, you know, mostly from the stream of commerce and modified. Genuinely homemade. Every part in that gun was homemade. We find that Stewart did not obtain his machine guns by using the channels of interstate commerce. We cannot agree that simple possession of machine guns, particularly possession of homemade machine guns, has a substantial effect on interstate commerce. Cases like Wirtz, now these are all the big com commerce cases in the United States uh, federal government. Cases like Wirtz and Wickard, Wickard was huge, were thus quite radical in their expansive conception of the Commerce Clause because they first articulated Congress's power to regulate persons and things twice and thrice removed from interstate commerce. See Lopez at that citation describing Wickard as ushering in an era of Commerce Clause jurisprudence that entirely, that greatly expanded, sorry, greatly expanded the previously defined authority of Congress under that clause. But this is commerce at all such as persons who builds a machine gun from scratch in his garage. So long as there is an otherwise valid statute that covers his activities, there is nothing in Wirtz, Wickard, Lopez, or in any of our cases, not even buried in a footnote, suggesting this understanding of the Commerce Clause is plausible. So what they're saying is, is you know, you genuinely make a homemade gun, that's outside the stream of commerce. And that's yours. And it's not regulated under the stream of commerce, like a motor vehicle, like a gun made by Smith & Wesson that you buy at, at uh, Bass Pro Shops or Cabela's or something, or your local gun dealer. Okay, that's all in the stream of commerce. Okay, now why did Wickard change things? Wickard was a case right around what time? Great Depression. <laughs> And once that bankruptcy happened, things dramatically changed in America for everybody. That Great Depression, that March 9th, that banking holiday, going back to March 9th of 1933, when you emerged out of that with, with uh, going off the gold standard domestically, you had silver until 1964, and then you went off the silver uh, in your money, as, in your coinage as well. So now you're completely debased and it's a petrodollar because, you know, basically the house of sod as a family is your 51st state that's financing, keeping your dollar uh, from completely burning and hyperinflation under, you know, agreements where, you know, not that Bretton Woods was completely abandoned, but it sort of was under the petrodollar where, you know, you know, the U.S. dollar is basically the reserve currency still because of the reserve status with the House of Saud so that it maintains some power internationally. Um, but, okay, so what's the deal here? What the deal is, is let's, if we're going to talk about a conveyance, a motorized conveyance, taking this example, how would you have to go about doing with a motor vehicle? You'd have to make it yourself from scratch outside the stream of commerce and then but now that that tackles the property but what about the use 
could you just take that? Could I just walk around? You know, let's let's take this example with the machine gun because he got his machine guns back. He he lost all those. He had to suffer a penalty for selling that stuff across state lines illegally against his federal firearms license. But the machine guns he got back. That's what he. That's what this case was all about. He sued to get those machine guns back, and he got them back because they weren't in articles in commerce. Okay. Now, but what happens if I if I were this guy and I took my homemade machine gun out on out in public, or you know, if I made a motor vehicle that was unique, genuinely homemade, everything made at home, and I start driving it on the public roads, could I get in trouble? Yeah, I might get in trouble. Why? Well, because that that's not my road. That's the state's road and the central bank's road. And... I would have to make sure if I wanted to try to avoid that that issue, I would have to make sure that my uniquely genuinely homemade motor vehicle all from scratch had all of the viable uh, safety standards that the state imposes on commercial motor vehicles. Why? Because I have to be righteous with the unrighteous mammon and I have to render to Caesar that which is Caesar's. So if I had any hope of legally fighting a legal battle to get my conveyance recognized judicially as a unusual, as a usual and ordinary conveyance private property right, like these machine guns, to be able to use, I would have to show in my righteousness that I was keeping up with the same safety standards that the state demands of its artificial persons that are making motor vehicles and selling them in the stream of commerce. So, you know, think of all the safety things that you have to have on a car according to statute. You know, proper lighting, you know, brake lights, seat belts, you know, all that sort of stuff. I would have to make sure, you know, a good fire, safety firewall, you know, all of that safety stuff to make sure that I was compliant with what the state would allow as a motor vehicle on its on its highways and, and on uh, public roads, okay. So there's a short little thing that think of it that way. As long as you make something homemade from scratch out of substance out of the earth, it's yours. But now there may be consequences if you try to take that property off of your property, even though you only have legal title to your land. If you try to take that thing that you genuinely homemade from substance off your property or from other places, as long as it's not interstate and foreign commerce, uh, you know, you may still have some issues when you go out into the public. Because that's where the state, the state has a duty to protect the public. Okay. So. Uh, that's just a little short video trying to help kind of carry this theme a little bit on how we went so wrong and what we'd have to do to fix it. Like I said, I've never even tried this because, you know, think about making a motor vehicle from scratch. You got to be able to smelt your own metal and make your own, you know, and it's not impossible, but you're not talking about making a Ford F-150. That's not unique. You know, you'd be going back to making something you know, like a Ford Model T, but something unique designed for you. You couldn't just make a Ford Model T, even though you made it yourself. It's got to remember what the court said. This was unique. That's what the, why, that's another part of this. And genuinely homemade. Okay, so it has to be your own design. But remember, there still may be consequences when you try to take whatever you make homemade out into the world of public, the public world. All right, take care of yourself. Talk to you later. Bye.